Thank you very much. God bless you. I uh, just want to say to all of you Marines in the audience here, I've taken the big words out of my presentation so you don't have to worry about anything here. Uh, just to make sure I know. You can tell who the Marines are. There's the Marine Corps mating call there. All right. God bless you. Thanks for your service. I'm going to jump right into my presentation here in the interest of time. You know, on the 15th of August of uh, last year, a man named Floyd Lee Corkins walked into the lobby of the Family Research Council with uh, a 9 millimeter pistol and 50 rounds of ammunition and 15 Chick-fil-A sandwiches. He shot our building manager, Floyd Lee Corkins, through the arm, was wrestled to the ground, and disarmed. On the 6th of February, Mr. Corkins pled guilty to three charges in a federal court in Washington, D.C. And when the judge asked him what his intentions were, he said, I was going to kill as many people as I possibly could and take a Chick-fil-A sandwich and smear it in their face. And then I was going on to two other organizations inside Washington. He said, why were you motivated to do this? He said, because I'm an activist for the LGBT community, the gay and lesbian community. I work at a gay and lesbian center, he said. And he said, uh, I found that uh, the Family Research Council and these two other organizations were hate groups. I found them on the website of the Southern Poverty Law Center. Hate groups. And the reason was because we stand on traditional marriage. We've taken a very positive biblical stand on traditional marriage. You know what? We're in a culture war, my friends, and it's about the future of this nation, and this is a serious culture war. It is more serious than most Americans understand. And it determines the future of America and what kind of nation our children and our grandchildren are going to grow up in. It's about values. It's about traditional values. You know, when Alexis de Tocqueville came to America in 1831 and eventually wrote this very important thing that he wrote called Democracy in America, de Tocqueville noticed something very interesting and he noticed that values were being taught in the school system and that the Bible was the dominant book in our schools. In fact, the first book ever printed by the United States government was the Bible. And it was articulated that it was to be used in our school systems. He saw freedom and religion working together, not apart, as he had seen in Europe. I want to read something to you from de Tocqueville as he talked about what he saw in America. And de Tocqueville said, Upon my arrival in the United States, the religious aspect of the country was the first thing that struck my attention. And the longer I stayed there, the more I perceived the great political consequences resulting from this new state of things. In France, I had almost always seen the spirit of religion and the spirit of freedom marching in opposite directions. But in America, listen to this, but in America, I found that they were intimately united and that they reigned in common over the same country. De Tocqueville went on to say something that most of you have heard quoted before, but I want to read it to you again as a reminder. He said, I sought for the key to the greatness and genius of America in her harbors, in her fertile fields and boundless forests, in her rich mines and vast world commerce, in her pub public school system and institutions of learning. I sought for it in her democratic congress and in her matchless constitution, but not until I went into the churches of America and heard her pulpits flame with righteousness did I understand the secret of her genius and power. America is great because America is good. And if America ever ceases to be good, America will cease to be great. The Bible tells us, Woe unto you who call good evil and evil good. And that's exactly what we're doing in America today. We're calling good evil and evil good. And we're paying the penalty for it because 
We're losing our nation. Our values are changing so rapidly. We're on the precipice of total destruction if we don't turn this around. And I mean that. I'll say it again. We're on the precipice of total destruction if we don't turn our value system around. You see... Our founding fathers gave us values that many of us don't even recognize today. They gave us the values of entrepreneurialism, of risk taking. You know, there's no risk today. If you get in trouble, we'll bail you out with government bailouts. They gave us the values of discovery, of adventure, and of competition, and taking care of our neighbors. You see, we're no longer a nation of givers. We're a nation of takers because we all want somebody to give us something. We want something from the government. Well, we should be a nation of givers, of looking out for our neighbors. Our founding fathers gave us the value of self-reliance, of accountability, of sacrifice, and of courage. Think about the 56 men that came into Philadelphia on the 2nd of July, 1776, and they signed a document called the Declaration of Independence. Do you realize that those men drew a big target on their chest, those 56 men? Because if they did not win this revolution, they would be executed as spies, as, as traitors to the crown of England. Where is that courage in America today? Where is that courage? Where's the leadership like that in America today? They valued courage and commitment and sacrifice. They also believed in something that was unique in their day, and it is still unique today. And it was this concept of inalienable rights. Rights that come from God, not from the king, not from the government, but from God. It's a value. It's an American value. And the question that we have to ask ourselves, and I ask you to ponder this, where is that church that Alexis de Tocqueville talked about in America today? Where is that church that should be the dominant influence in our society, that should influence everything that we do, the way we think, the way we act? Where is that church today? And the answer is, this church may be one of those churches. But across the nation, the church has been silent. The church is not the dominant influence in America today. It doesn't shape our values because the church has been silent. Where we're now calling good evil and evil good even inside the churches across America today. And it's killing us as a nation. When we look to Hollywood and... Uh, our heroes come out of Beverly Hills or FedEx Stadium. Our values are shaped by Hollywood and the media. You know, we're in an atmosphere of amusement. Think about it for a moment. Muse means to think. Amuse means not thinking. <laughs> and we sit mindlessly in front of television watching nonsense. Ladies and gentlemen, the church was called to be the salt and light in America. The church is called to shape our values, to shape our understanding. You know, in the colony of Virginia, there was a time when it was illegal not to be in church at least one Sunday out of the month because that's where you came to be informed. That's where you came to understand what was going on in the, in the colonies at the time. Today the church is silent. Today the church is compromised. Today the church is not shaping the values of America. What's happening in America today with absentee fathers because we don't have the value of accountability and responsibility. We have men today that think that fathering a child is what's important. That's not what's important. It's being a father to those children. Where are the values associated with the sacrifice the sacrifice that one has to make to be a father to a child. You know, this time has come for the church to rise up in America. I'm telling you, if you go back and look historically, it was the church that brought about the American Revolution, the Black Robe Regiment, the pastors that began to press into these men of influence and say, we must secede, we must separate ourselves from the crown of England. 
Men like John Peter Gabriel Muhlenberg who stood up in his pulpit on the 21st of January 1776 and read from Ecclesiastes 3 and came to the end of his sermon and he said there's a time for peace and there's a time for war and he removed his black robe to reveal the uniform of a colonel of the 8th Virginia militia. He went outside and mounted his horse and he said, Who among you will ride with me in the cause of liberty? And even the Civil War was brought about by the church as it began to raise the awareness of the inconsistency of these words that says we hold these truths to be self-evident. That all men are created equal and endowed by their Creator with certain inalienable rights among them as life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Amen. And when you hold the black man a slave, it is inconsistent with those words. We either believe it or we don't. And the church brought about the Civil War that cost us 600,000 lives and many lives destroyed. But we righted the wrong of slavery. It was the church. And today, my folks, we are losing America because the church has been silent. The church has compromised. The church has come up with so many things that are unscriptural. And the church should be shaping our values, not the ACLU, not Southern Poverty Law Center, not ACORN, MoveOn.org, and Planned Parenthood. It should be the church. Rise up. It's time for the church to rise up and reestablish itself as the dominant influence in our society today. And when I say the church, my ladies and gentlemen, I'm not talking about just the pastors. I'm talking about each of us that are believers in Jesus Christ, that are in a relationship with Christ. It is time for us to rise up as individuals and stand boldly and say, I'm going to stand on biblical truth. And I don't care what you say about me in the media. I don't care how you shun me in my neighborhood. I'm going to stand on biblical truth because the day will come when I'm going to stand before Jesus Christ and give an account of my life at the judgment seat of Christ. I'm going to give an account and it's not for my sins because I've already confessed them, but it's all about what I've done since God gave me the redemption of His mighty grace. What have I done with the opportunities you've given me? What have I done with the blessings and the anointings? I will stand before God and give an account. I'm not accountable to the U.S. media. I'm not accountable to those pundits from the ACLU and the Southern Poverty Law Center. I'm not accountable to them. I'm accountable to God. And it is time. There's a third great awakening coming in this nation today that's going to change the landscape of America. But you got to decide. Are you going to be a spectator or are you going to be a player? i got to finish with this because I've only got a minute. But I'm going to tell you something. You know, many of you know that I commanded the Delta Force during the events called Black Hawk Down. And on the morning after that battle, as I sat on my bunk, my command sergeant major came over to me and he said, Colonel, are you ready to go? I got up and put my cap on and I took a deep breath and I walked across that airfield and I got to the other side of the airfield with my sergeant major. And there was a big tent over there and over the top of that tent it said this, it said, Mortuary Affairs. It was a morgue. He pulled the flap back and he said to me, Sir, are you, are you ready? I swallowed hard and I walked into that tent as I knew what was in there. There were 15 bags laid out in a row. And they were what we call body bags. And a young staff sergeant went up to me and said, Sir, would you follow me? I followed her and I knelt down by that first bag and she opened it and... And when she did, I looked into the face, the cold, ashen face of a man that only a day before I'd been laughing and joking with. One of my soldiers of the 15 that I'd lost there. And she went down that line and she opened each one and said, Can you identify this man? And every time that I identified that man, I asked myself the same question and it was this. Did I do everything I could? Did I do everything I could to make sure this man was ready for this battle? To make sure that he had heard the gospel of Jesus Christ and was prepared for this very day? Did I do everything I could? Let me tell you something, folks. You need to be asking yourself that question right now. Have I done everything I can? Did I do everything I can to avoid the day that we'll be looking into the face of this country 
and say it's gone. We've lost it. Ask yourself now while there's time to do something and to prepare for a third great awakening. Have I done everything I can? May the Lord bless you and God bless America. Thank you.